Okay, we're going to do the index of hydrogen deficiency calculation, or in other words, we're going to have a count of the number of double bonds or rings within our molecule. So this is useful for con converting a molecular formula into a structure. It's definitely one piece of the puzzle. So the formula that we're going to use is the normal formula. So the number of carbons plus one plus the number of nitrogens minus the number of hydrogens minus the number of halogens all divided by all divided by two. So if we put our numbers into this, we'll get back out our index of hydrogen deficiency or account for how many double bonds we are expecting. So let's do that for this example here. Well, in the case of the blue molecule, we have 10 carbons plus one minus uh, well, there are, sorry, plus, there are no nitrogens, minus 16 hydrogens, there are no halogens, all divided by 2. So 10 plus 1 is 11, minus 16 over 2 is 8, is going to give us 3 in total. So this molecule here is going to have 3 double bonds or 3 uh, rings in it in total, or some combination of double bonds and rings. You'll notice that the oxygens don't appear in this formula. We just ignore the oxygens in all cases. You can try it for uh, any other example. So let's make up another molecule. So supposing we have over here, supposing we have C7H4, uh, Cl3F3. Well, now we have a chlorofluorocarbon. So let's think about our same formula here. Our index of hydrogen deficiency is going to be the number of carbons, which is seven, plus one, uh, plus, and then in brackets, minus four, and then there are six halogens in total, minus six, all divided by two. And so if we work that out, seven plus one is eight, minus, that'll be minus 10 divided by two, so minus five, so that's also going to have an index of hydrogen deficiency of three. In other words, there are also three double bonds or cyclic structures or some combination of both within that molecule. So if that's all you're looking for, it can end here. If you're wondering why that is, well, all we need to do is think back to our formulas for alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. If you remember the formula for an alkane was for some number of carbons, you would have 2n plus 2 hydrogens. Because if we take, for example, butane or any um, hydrocarbon, what you find is that every carbon within the chain has two hydrogens attached to it. And then at the end, you've got to cap that off with one hydrogen on either end. So plus an extra two. And what we found is if we put in a double bond, well, wherever the double bond is, you're going to have to lose hydrogen from either side in order to accommodate the new bond. So if we have an alkene, we would have CnH2n. And we could draw that out as trans-2-butene if we wanted, or whatever it happens to be. But we can see that all we've done to go from here to here to add in a double bond is going to be to take away two hydrogens. Well, the same applies, of course, if you make this a cyclic molecule. So if we make it one, two, three, four, if we make it cyclobutane, we can see that we no longer need the two hydrogens for capping either end. Of course, we can add in additional double bonds or make a triple bond. And as we do that, each time we subtract out two hydrogens. So that's where the carbons and the hydrogens come from in this. What about the halogens? Well, if you put in a halogen, if we replace this hydrogen here and we say, well, what if that was chlorine? Well, the halogens only form a bond to one other element, so they act exactly the same as a hydrogen, which is why we take away the hydrogens and the halogens. It doesn't matter whether it's chlorine, iodine, bromine, or fluorine. What about nitrogen? Well, if we put nitrogen into a molecule, we can see that nitrogen can bond to three things at once. So if we have diethylamine here, we'll see that every time we put an additional nitrogen into our chain, we have to add on one extra hydrogen so that all of its 
than they're accounted for. So again, we have to add that one extra hydrogen in it before we start taking them away to make sure that they are sufficient for all the double bonds or for no double bonds to exist, and whatever the difference is, is then how many double bonds there are. Finally then, oxygen. Well, oxygen, we know, is divalent, so you attach something to either side. So whether or not there's an oxygen in this molecule isn't going to affect, uh, sorry, so I'll add one more on there. So here is propyl ethyl ether, and here is pentane, and they will have exactly the same number of carbons and hydrogens, because the oxygen just bonds at either end, and there's no additional, there's only two lone pairs, there's no additional hydrogens brought into the molecule. So we can ignore oxygens. By the same token, we can ignore sulfurs. Again, no additional hydrogens uh, needed in order to satisfy all those hydrogens to make them all single bonds. So sulfurs can be ignored as well. So that hopefully explains where this formula comes from. Uh, you can have think about it in a little bit more depth if you need to, but what's important for us this year is that you can use this formula. So the number of carbons plus one minus uh, the number of hydrogens and the number of halogens divided by two, and if there's a nitrogen, well then you have to subtract one hydrogen for each nitrogen in the molecule. That's all for now.